Parach is a scholar of modern and contemporary Middle East studies in general and Armenian studies in, in particular. Since 2012, he's an associate of the Faculty of Oriental Studies, University of Oxford. As an activist and a public intellectual, in recent years, he's drawn attention to the plight of religious and ethnic minorities in the Middle East, especially in academic and policy making circles. Crutch has lectured internationally and is the author of numerous articles and publications. He's an expert on the South Caucasus, where he's conducted fieldwork and research for over 25 years. Besides his many studies and articles about the region, he's the author of the book, The Struggle for Independence in the Post-Soviet South Caucasus, Garabakh and Abkhazia, 2003. Uh, so, Hrach, I think that's it from me. Uh, it's over to you now. Thank you, Armine, for the introduction and for the invite, invitation to speak about a historical subject that perhaps not surprisingly has far more relevance to current events and the future, I think. As one British observer put it, history is an extension of territory to be claimed and defended with fortresses of fact. And I think the subject tonight is one of those cases. Yet in this age of post-truth and manufacturing alternative facts, it seems that anything and everything could be instrumentalized or highly politicized. My talk is divided into two main parts. First, I shall provide an introduction and a discussion of the rich Christian heritage in Karabakh. And then in the second part, I shall focus on the current efforts of denial, erasure, and reinvention of the Christian heritage in this region. Now, in the fourth century, soon after Armenia's conversion to Christianity, the Kingdom of Albania, and I should note that it should not be confused with the Albania in the Balkan country. Uh, the ancient kingdom of Albania included the provinces of Artsakh, the future Karabakh and Utik, converted to Christianity through the efforts of St. Gregory the Illuminator, the evangelizer of Armenia. Grigoris, the grandson of Gregory, was appointed the head of the Albanian church around 330 AD. He was martyred in 338 while evangelizing in the northeast region of the country near Derbent, today in Russia's Dagestan uh, region. His body was brought to Artsakh and buried in a church in Amaras in the Martuni region in 489. And this was done by King Vachakan the Pious, who renovated the complex and built a special chapel dedicated to Grigoris. The monastery of Amaras has been one of the most important shrines in Karabakh and is considered a holy site for pilgrims, but today, as we speak, it is under Azerbaijani control. The Albanian church, having been established by Armenian missionaries, pledged canonical allegiance to the Armenian church. In 552, the seat of the head of the Albanian church was moved from Derbent to Bartav, and an Albanian Catholic crusade was established. The Patriarch of the Albanian Church was given the title Catholicos of Arvank, Artsakh and Udik, and received his ordination and canonical authority from the Catholicos of Armenia. From the 11th to the 13th century, 
more than 40 monasteries and major religious centers were built in Karabakh through the patronage and efforts of the Armenian princes of Artsakh. One of the most famous clans to have contributed to the revival of the church and piety in Artsakh is the Hassan Jalal princely family who besides building the famous monastery of Ganzasar have given several Catholicoses and bishops for the service of the church in Karabakh. The epitaph of Metropolitan Baghdasar, the last clergyman in the Jalal clan, who is, by the way, buried in the courtyard of the mon monastery of Ganzasar, reads, this is the tombstone of Metropolitan Baghdasar, an Armenian Albanian from the family of Jalal, the great prince of the land of Artsakh, dated July 3, 1854. Prince Hassan Jalal was also buried in the same monastery in 1261. Starting in the 15th century, the monastery of Ganzasar became the seat of the native Catholicos of the Albanian church. The existence of a separate Catholicos in Karapal with its own autonomous religious institutions attests to the importance of the region as a religious center. In the 19th century, the status of the native Catholicos was drastically reduced. When Tsarist Russia liberated Karabakh from Persian domination, Catholicos Sarkis of Karabakh, upon his return from exile, was demoted to the rank of Metropolitan by a decision of the imperial authorities in 1815. Metropolitan Sarkis headed the sea until his death in 1828. After his death, upon the request of the Meliks, the princes of Karabakh, Catholicos Yeprem of Echmiadzin in 1830 ordained Baghdasar, a nephew of Sarkis, primate of the diocese of Karabakh. He was ordained in the mother cathedral of Echmiadzin. Thus, the Catholic state of Karabakh was reduced first to a metropolitan seat and then to a diocese of the Armenian church under Echmiadzin. Between 1820 and 1930, Karabakh was a hub of vibrant religious and cultural life. The Diocese of Karabakh and Swiss missionaries, the Basel Evangelical Association, operated 10 schools in Shushi alone and founded the first printing press in the region in 1828. Church and privately owned printing houses published over 150 titles on biblical, theological, philosophical, scientific and library, uh, literary subjects rather. More than a dozen newspapers and journals were published in Shushi, such as ethnographer Yervant Lalayan's ethnographic journal, uh, as well as other volumes. A remnant of this religious cultural renaissance is the famous cathedral of our savior built between 1868 and 1887 in the Ghasan Chetsot neighborhood of Shushi, the dome of which unfortunately was decapitated last week by Azerbaijan. Prominent scholars and teachers taught at the diocesan school in Shushi, the well-known monk teacher Hofsep Artsakheti among them. He was the first Armenian philosopher on synthetic logic after the German school of philosophers and wrote uh, on logic and epistemology. His, his first work, first element of philosophy, logic, was published in 1840. 
Interestingly, there were also women monastics and deaconesses in Shushi, which is a rare phenomenon in the Armenian church. And these deaconesses were involved with social and pastoral work under the aegis of the diocese. Now coming to the early Soviet period. In 1923, when Soviet rule was established in mountainous Karabakh, the Armenian church was the first national institution to face monumental obstacles as a result of the growing Soviet pressure on religious institutions. The Armenian prelate of Baku, Bishop Mateos, in a letter in November 1924, addressed to the Supreme Religious Council in Echmiadzin, reports that despite the state's general decree on freedom of conscious and religious services, local communist leaders are taking violent and extreme measures against the priest and the church. At the end of the letter, Bishop Mateos urges Echmiadzin to send the prelate to Karapakh without delay, and in the meantime, ask them to write formally to the central authorities in Karabakh to bring to their attention the illegal acts of the regional officials. In response, in 1925, the Catholicos in Echmiadzin appointed Archimandrite, later Bishop Vertanes, as the prelate of the church in Karapakh and dispatch him to the region to oversee the administration of the church. Since the city of Shushi was out of bound, the Armenian neighborhoods had been burnt down and the diocesan headquarters closed at the time. So the new prelate chose the monastery of Ganzasar as his diocesan center. He visited the churches and the monasteries in Karabakh and sent several reports to Echmiadzin about the worsening conditions of the church and the pressure on his own activities. The Commissar for Internal Affairs of Mountainous Karabakh closely monitored his activities as well as the other priests. In 1929, the now uh, Bishop Vertanes, in a letter to Catholicos Gevork V in Echmiadzin, laments the situation of the church in Karapakh. And he says, every day, dozens of churches and monasteries are being closed. Clergymen are being imprisoned and exiled. Please help us in this dire situation, he pleads. All we are left with, he says, 112 functioning churches, 18 monasteries, and 276 priests. In the meantime, the efforts of Echmiadzin to negotiate with the authorities over the plight of the church in Karapakh did not obviously yield any results. On February 7, 1930, Bishop Vertanes was arrested and jailed. Having spent almost two years in prison, he was released on January 1st, 1932, as the Supreme Court did not find him guilty of any crime. Upon his release, he returned to Echmiadzin to recuperate and was never allowed to return to Karabakh. There were 250 to 300 priests serving in Karapakh and its, re uh, and its regions from the late 19th century to the early 20th century. For more than 50 years, there were no functioning churches or clergymen in Karapakh. Now, in March 1988, in, the in an effort to pacify the popular uprising and demonstrations in Yerevan and Stepanakert, which had started the previous month, the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union issued a decree on social economic developments in Nagorno-Karabakh. 
This also created a climate for a cultural and religious revival in the region. Prior to the formal opening of the church, a renewed interest in religion and the church was created by the visits of preachers belonging to the church-loving brotherhood of the Armenian church, who starting in 1987, attracted a group of people who later converted and became committed Christians. This coincided with the time at the beginning of the National Liberation Movement when secretly protest signatures were being collected in Karapakh. In early 1988, these new converts started to secretly collect signatures to have churches reopened in Karapakh. This was in addition to the larger signature campaign taking place for political and territorial changes at the time. The signatures of the uh, believers were presented to the Soviet authorities and a copy was given to the Catholicos in Echmiadzin. This campaign of the believers in Karabakh provided Catholicos Vasken the first with additional leverage with the authorities to re-establish the long defunct diocese of Karabakh. So in November 1988, he appointed Barkev Martirosian as a prelate of the reconstituted diocese of Karabakh. Soon after, the newly appointed prelate, together with four priests, came to Karabakh to establish the diocese. The first church was formally reopened on October 1st, 1989, at the monastery of Ganzasaj. And this was done after six months of preparatory work and reconstruction of the building. On that day, the bishop declared in his sermon, and I quote, today is the beginning of our victories. Now we could say the victories that 30 years later turned into defeat in November 2020. In the early 1990s, the first task of the church leadership in Karapal was to renovate churches and provide places of worship. Special attention was given to the opening of historically important monasteries, such as Amaras and Ganzasar. Between 1989 and 1991, the clergy were involved in active evangelization throughout Karabakh. Sunday schools were established, teachers were trained to instruct the children, and prepare them for baptism. Weekly lectures on religion and Christianity were presented by the bishop and so on. Within three years of its reestablishment, the Armenian church had regained its legitimacy, not only as a religious institution, but also as a national institution that fought alongside the people of Karabakh. The church was one of the first national institutions that was reclaimed by the people, even by those who were unbelievers as a historically significant source of their religious and national identity. The functioning of their, what they called mountain protecting monasteries uh, and churches provided hope for the Karapakhtis who were facing uncertainties in their struggle while the prospect of war with Azerbaijan was uh, increasing even at the time. The consecration of the protector, Holy Mother of God Cathedral in the heart of Stepanakert in April 2019 was the symbolic crowning of three decades of hard work and Christian ministry in Artsakh under the leadership of Archbishop Barkev Martirosyan. It took 12 years to build the cathedral, which resembles the 7th century Zvartnots church in Armenia. 
Interestingly, a four meter statue of King Vachakan III, the fifth century sponsor king of the chapel dedicated to Grigoris that I noted earlier, was planned to be placed on a two meter pedestal in the compound of the cathedral. During the devastating 44 day war last year, the cathedral served as a shelter from the bombs on Stepanakert, but it continues to stand as a symbol of hope and rebuilding. Now, the instrumentalization of religion by Azerbaijan in this non-religious conflict over Karapal is not new, and the continued policies of denial, erasure, and reinvention would make a final resolution and reconciliation between Armenians and Azerbaijanis even more difficult, obviously. It is likely that religion will continue to be instrumentalized in this region to pursue political and diplomatic interests rather than for the pursuit of peace. Long before the start of the armed conflict in Karapakh, the authentication of the history of the region had become the scholarly background, battleground rather, of historians, political scientists, archaeologists, researchers, and bureaucrats. The consequences of Soviet scholarship, particularly in the process of constructing histories, have been disastrous and continue to have a negative impact on how conflicting parties view the other. Since the second Artsakh war, the Azerbaijani authorities are, on one hand, continuing to exploit the propagandistic histories created in the Soviet period to shape public perceptions about the Armenians, the enemy, and so on. On the other hand, are actively engaged in systematic erasure of Armenian religious and cultural heritage on territories under their control. This is accompanied with systematic denial of all evidence and rewriting of history. Now, despite the lack of linguistic and cultural uh, similarities, Azerbaijani historiography has constructed an Albanian connection in the ethnogenesis of the Azerbaijani nation. Under this narrative, historic Caucasian Albania is presented as the social, cultural, and territorial predecessor of contemporary Azerbaijan, thus refuting Armenian claims to Karabakh. In recent years, references to Armenians in primary historical sources in the new editions of early Chronicles of Karabakh published in Baku have been all deleted or, or uh, altered. Caucasian Albania was a state in Eastern Trans Transcaucasia whose population between fourth and 11th centuries was absorbed by the Armenians, Persians, Arabs, and Turks. As linguist Wolfgang Schulz explains, and I quote, the question remains whether we can relate this statehood to a particular ethnic unit termed Caucasian Albanians, unquote. The roots of the Azerbaijani historiography on Caucasian Albania go back to the Soviet policy of nativization, colonization, whereby the construction of national histories in the Soviet republics was part of the official state teaching that national identity is inseparable from the given territory of a national republic. 
the nativization policy was intended to promote, for instance, national cultures and higher education and increase the number of natives in the Communist Party structures within a given republic. In line with this policy, the official history of the majority ethnic populations and that of their republics became virtually interchangeable. The Soviet state's political operational code was one republic, one culture. Thus, Azerbaijani historians produced histories of Azerbaijan in the medieval period based not on the historical facts of a prior national state, but on the assumption that the genealogy of the present day uh, Azerbaijani Republic could be traced in terms of putative ethnic territorial continuity. While the ethnogenesis of the Azerbaijanis is a matter of academic debate, most scholars agree that Azerbaijan as a national entity emerged after 1918. The debate on what to name the Azerbaijanis goes back to the late 19th century, whereby the population of Azerbaijan formerly were categorized as Turks or Transcaucasian Tatars was, uh, this formulation was re-identified formally as Azerbaijani in 1937. As Vafa Gülüzadeh, a prominent advisor to the president of Azerbaijan, the late Gülüzadeh, affirmed, he said, the very concept Azerbaijani is an anachronism from the Soviet period. Our language is Turkish and by nationality, we are Turks, unquote. In the Middle Ages, the territory of what is Azerbaijan today was inhabited by indigenous Caucasian peoples, which included the Christian Caucasian Albanian kingdom, as I noted earlier. In the context of the Armenian Azerbaijani conflict, the Albanian connection has become a politicized issue of irredentism. Azerbaijani historians, by establishing a connection between present-day Azerbaijanis and Caucasian Albanians, and this in addition to providing a common national history, sustained the idea of ethnic continuity and presence in Karabakh and Armenia for that matter. And they demonstrate that Karabakh Armenians are relatively recent immigrants to the region and thus a non-indigenous people living on ancient Azerbaijani lands. Reinterpretation of history has been intertwined with Azerbaijan's self-perception in contemporary times. The most important theorist and proponent of this national identity in Azerbaijan was Zia Buniatov, a historian, academician, and a well-known figure in Azerbaijani politics. His publications have become canonical sources for Azerbaijani scholars, politicians, and state institutions. I will come back to this a little later. Over the decades, historians in Armenia have been engaged in refuting Azerbaijani historical claims, especially since the intensification of the Armenian-Azerbaijani conflict in the late 1980s. They've used evidence from prehistoric periods, primary medieval sources, and modern scholarship on the region. But Karabakh Armenians living on the land rather than in history books, point to the hundreds of ancient monuments, ruins of religious buildings, churches and monasteries as living witnesses to Armenian presence in Karabakh. 
the history of Christianity and presence of the Armenian church in what is today Karabakh is recorded by numerous historians, historians uh, as I mentioned, started, starting in medieval times, uh, recorded by religious monuments and architectural evidence and artifacts. Nevertheless, especially since the war, the last war, the Azerbaijani government and institutions have intensified the process of rewriting the history of the post-Albanian period of Armenian monuments in the 11th to 17th centuries period. <clears throat> Any Armenian religious or cultural heritage before the 19th century is presented as Albanian or Caucasian Albanian. Any Armenian religious or cultural heritage between the 19th and the 20th centuries are presented as visual proof that Armenians are newcomers to the region and that Armenians have appropriated Azerbaijani Turkish heritage. Now, <clears throat> I would like to move into my uh, second part of my uh, presentation for which I will use my uh, slides. <clears throat> now, I'm sure as you follow the news and the developments in this region, uh, what we, we could observe, there are three main I believe areas or strategies rather that official Azerbaijani government is uh, employing uh, to advance their particular narrative. First, it's the denial of facts, any historical or uh, material uh, facts, erasure of evidence and continued reinvention an invention of history. And all this strategy is intended to dehumanize and demonize the Armenians and thus the Armenian presence, historic presence in uh, Karabakh. <clears throat> now, the Azerbaijani state narrative uh, is not new. And it does not only suffice there uh, uh, what, hap what is happening in Karabakh, but in, in recent years, it includes Armenia. Now, when we look back, this is eight years ago, a tweet by President Aliyev. He presents Armenia or describes Armenia as a territory artificially created on ancient Azerbaijani lands, and that Armenia as a country is of no value. More recently, April of this year, he keeps tweeting similar ideas, <clears throat> once again saying, the Armenians have invented history that they never had. They are responsible for the psychological trauma sustained by their own people. So it's not that the invention is by uh, uh, Azerbaijan, but Armenians have invented this uh, history. More so, President Aliyev has been even more vocal in recent years about southern Armenia, the Zangezu region. And this is one of his uh, tweets where he calls West Zangezur again part of historic Azerbaijani lands. Now, <clears throat> this of course has its uh, it's, it didn't happen overnight, but we will see how various efforts, institutions, and the whole uh, state apparatus is involved in this process. Now, for example, I'm going to show you, this is a Facebook page 
that was uh, created recently called Monuments in Western Azerbaijan. Here we see that it was created in July 2020, a few months before the start of the Second Artakh War. What's interesting here is that the creator originally called it West Azerbaijan, monuments in West Azerbaijan, and then changed it to monuments in Western Azerbaijan. <clears throat> and this is, I think, it's not accidental or an error because as opposed to indicating a geographic location, when you say Western part of a country or a state, you're alluding to it being part of that state entity. And now we'll see why. According to this Facebook, the territory of Western Azerbaijan is one of the historical parts of United Azerbaijan. So obviously you have Eastern Azerbaijan, Western Azerbaijan, Northern Azerbaijan, and Southern Azerbaijan, which is in Iran, as far as they're concerned. Today, the Republic of Armenia is located on these ancestral lands of Azerbaijani Turks. And it goes on and on. So basically, all of Armenia today is part of historic Azerbaijan. Many of the monuments remaining on the territory of Armenia were destroyed or appropriated by the Armenians who mainly appeared in the region at the beginning of the 19th century. And then on various websites, you have pictures like this. For instance, this is a, a building in Yerevan, uh, which is presented as a remnant of an Azerbaijani uh, palace. Uh, remains of a palace which Armenians have appropriated. Or <clears throat> there are even on uh, Twitter an account called Yerevan Azerbaijani in Armenian, which in English translates Yerevan is Azerbaijani or is Azerbaijan, where uh, they do regular posts claiming again, uh, territorial claims on what is Armenia today. And once again, here, we read that most of Karabakh Armenians are Iranian Armenians from Isfahan and so on. And before 1813, there wasn't any Armenian in Karabakh. And interestingly, some of this writing obviously is juxtaposes with Turkish nationalism. And here the post says, Libya has been Turkish soil for 600 years. It is more than natural that Libya rejoins to its eternal motherland, Turkey. And these, for those of you uh, are, uh, don't know, these are the architects of the Armenian genocide uh, in 1915. Uh, and it's perhaps not accidental that this picture is posted on this uh, post. Now, <clears throat> just to give you the historical fact, at least on this uh, example of that Armenians are, uh, have not existed in these territories before 1813. Now, according to Article 15 of the Treaty of Turkmenchai, provide provided a year's time for the Armenians of Azerbaijan, which at the time the reference is to Northern Iran, to sell their properties and move to Russia. By the way, the Treaty of Turkmenchai uh, ended the uh, Russo-Persian War uh, when Russia was victorious and Persia gave up land uh, to the Russian Empire. So in, this is part of that treaty. So thousands of Armenians whose ancestors had been forcibly taken to Azerbaijan by Shah Abbas, repatriated 
to the newly created Armenian province in 1828 and 1829. Now, again, as a background, in 1604 to 1605, Armenians of Van, Bayazid, Erevan, Nakhichevan, and Julfa were deported by Shah Abbas, which was a blow to the economy of Eastern Armenia and Eastern uh, Anatolia. Now, I want to quote a uh, historian, uh, George Bornukian, who has published a, an important book uh, based on uh, documents in, from the Russian, uh, Tsarist Russian uh, archives, state archives. And he makes the following uh, important point. Despite overwhelming evidence of the Armenian presence in Karabakh, a number of Azeri historians insist that the Armenians are newcomers to the region. They claim that the Armenian population of Karabakh arrived there after 1828, when thousands of Armenians immigrated from Persia. Their claims have been blindly accepted by a number of Western scholars. Tsarist Russian state archival documents firmly refute all such claims. In 1822, the Russian administration decided to survey the Armenian population in Transcaucasia to determine how many non-Orthodox Christians were in the parts of the region under Russian rule. The survey began in early 1823 and was completed on 17th April of that year. It's more than 300 pages recorded both the Armenian and Muslim populations. Thus, the five mountainous districts of Karabakh, which according to Persian and Turkish sources, has constitu uh, constituted the five or Khamse Armenian Meliktums for at least three centuries, had an overwhelming Armenian population before 1828. The districts of Datev, Kiapar, and Bargashat, which form part of present-day Zangezur, but which were then included in Karabakh, were also overwhelmingly Armenian. The survey lists Goris and Khan Kend, Khan Kendi as the Azerbaijanis call it, Stepanager today, as Armenian settlements as well. Now, this kind of narrative on Facebook and by the president uh, has also, based on some uh, reinvention and rewriting, reappropriation of history that has been done over the decades. I want to give you one example uh, of uh, a classic example of Azerbaijani uh, publications, so-called uh, uh, scientific studies. This is a, pub, a book called The Monuments of Western Azerbaijan, published by the Ministry of Culture of Azerbaijan. And <clears throat> uh, it was published in Azerbaijani and later in English. The first edition was in 19. 94 later editions in 2006 and since then it has been published several times the editors of the book are academicians at the national academy of sciences of azerbaijan historians and scientists and so on and so forth now in this book what we see when you open the page, the first page of the book shows you this map with the caption, the map, the ancient Turkish Oruz land, Western Azerbaijan, present day, the Republic of Armenia. So every inch of present Republic of Armenia is actually Western Azerbaijan. And we know this thanks to the scientific research of academicians in Azerbaijan. And in this book, 
it's uh, made very clear that this Turkish Oğuz hearth and historically Azerbaijani land uh, is uh, Turkish up to the last inch, no less. So it's quite clear and measured. Even Urartu, the Urartium per uh, period uh, that is part of history of what is Armenia now, that's also originally was called country of Az, and it's Turkic as well. Anything and everything in Armenia uh, uh, in terms of cultural and religious heritage is Turkish and Azerbaijani. Here we see the Karahunç, the 2 BC, uh, called, according to this book, a distant view of Goshundash stones in ancient Turkish hearth Garakilisa, the second millennium BC. So according to these scholars, there was a Turkish nation or known as Turkish nation in second millennium BC. The temple of Garni, which is uh, established as a first century Roman a temple in the territory of Armenia. No, we are all wrong. It's the ruins of Garni temple referring to ancient Gargar Turks in the first century. The Khorvirap Monastery, this is one of the holiest places for Armenian Christianity where Saint Gregory the Illuminator, the, uh, uh, who converted the Armenian nation to Christianity by baptizing the Armenian church, as well as the Illuminator of the Albanian, Caucasian Albanians. Nevertheless, now we know, uh, thanks to the research in, at the Academy of Sciences of Azerbaijan, that Actually, this is an ancient Turkish temple, Khorvirap, the sixth century. They didn't bother to translate Khorvirap because in Armenian, Khorvirap means deep a pit where St. Gregory was imprisoned. Even the Holy See of Echmiadzin, the cathedral of Echmiadzin, uh, is Turkish is a Turkey, Arman Turkish Christian temple, Üç Kilisa Eçmiyadin. Üç Kilisa in Turkish translate means three church, Eçmiyadin, the seventh century. The church of, the ruins of the church of Zvartnot, it's actually according to our Azerbaijani colleagues, the ruins of the sky angels, Turkish temple, seventh century. Now the word in Armenian, Zavartnot, means angels, which here is translated into sky angels. So we need, it would be interesting to find out what sky angels are. Another uh, a church in uh, Sisavank, Vank, uh, is obviously Turkish, but also the state of his as Garakilisa territory was also the motherland of the Turkish Oğuz tribes. And without doubt, the first Armenians were moved from Turkey to the Garakilisa settlement in 1890, without a doubt. So this is the type of historiography that we are uh, talking about. Now, to go back a little bit uh, further uh, in previous decades, uh, the godfather of Azeri national historiography is Zia Bunyatov, which I mentioned uh, in my introduction, a well-known historian in Azerbaijan, academician, uh, a member of uh, the National Academy of Sciences of Azerbaijan, 
uh, and head of the Institute of History, World War II veteran, hero of the Soviet Union, and uh, a recipient of many national awards. He is uh, the main theorist and uh, propag uh, propagator of the idea that Caucasian Albanians are the ancestors of the uh, Azerbaijanis who are living in Azerbaijan today. Uh, and that every monument, every cultural presence and production are Caucasian Albanian and there is nothing uh, Armenian that could be uh, viewed there. However, uh, inter obviously for decades, these theories have been uh, refuted. But most recently in 2019, at the University of Amsterdam, uh, uh, a lady, uh, Sarah uh, Krombach, has written a PhD dissertation on Zia Bunyatov and the invention of an Azerbaijani past. This thesis is available online and could be down downloaded for free. And uh, one, uh, once you read, then everything becomes quite uh, clear as to what is happening in terms of uh, the propaganda. Here, let me just quote a few important uh, 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 statements from the research which are relevant to our discussion. Uh, Krombach writes, Bunyatov shaped the face of Azerbaijani oriental studies and historiography. His scholarly publications played an important role in the development of an Azerbaijani national identity. He was able to use the allegedly on political division of Soviet Oriental studies to produce highly political work. And goes on, for Bunyatov, Caucasian Albania was the cradle of the nation, a theory that offered several politically important advantages, such as the idea of the Azerbaijani people as an ancient nation indigenous to the region. Although Budnyatov's work had always carried a political message, in the second half of the 1980s, his political agenda becomes less veiled. In this period, his publications are openly aggressive towards Armenia and first of all meant to mobilize the nation with regard to the escalating conflict over uh, Nagorni Karabakh. So, overall, Bunyatov made a tremendous contribution to national pride by inventing a glorious past for the Azerbaijani nation that managed to reconcile several contradictory elements. His historical canon was and still is of great significance for the process of nation building, first within the context of the USSR and after 1991 for independent Azerbaijan. Now, uh, as I said, over the decades, Dunyatov's work has been uh, refuted and criticized. And one of the famous uh, Russian historians, Igor Diakonov, has uh, uh, noted in uh, review of Bunyatov's work that Bunyatov became uh, famous for a scientific edition of a historical source from where all mentions on Armenians have been carefully eliminated. Nevertheless, for Azerbaijan, Bunyatov and his uh, theories and his uh, formulations are still important. And President Haidar Aliyev, the late president of Azerbaijan, described him that Zia Bunyatov had a great influence on our youth and he was the constructor of our identity and self-consciousness. 
constructor of our identity. So it's a process of constructing identity. Now, in the process of this identity construction and invention of theories and historical, quasi-historical uh, narrative, the thesis of these Caucasian Albanian Christians, especially after the uh, recent war, has been moved to uh, the forefront of the state and institutional narrative in Azerbaijan. Here, for instance, we see a headline in a Turkish newspaper where uh, these the, the descendants of the Albanian uh, Christians who are the Udi uh, community in uh, Azerbaijan. I will come in a uh, bit about them. So it says in Turkish that Christians as well were saved from Armenian persecutions. And here in this same article, one of the leaders of the Udi uh, explains the following. Armenians wanted to destroy us. They stole everything, especially our religion, for centuries, said Rafik Danankari, the deputy leader of the Caucasian Udi Albanian Christian community. He said the main aim of the Tsarist Russian colonial policy in the Caucasus region was to reduce the number of the Muslim population and establish ethnic pockets for political dominance in the region. To this end, Russia deliberately promoted Christianity based on the Orthodox Church. Russia perceived the Armenians as a homogeneous community close to the Orthodox. In this process of historical development, the historical Albanian monument, Holy Elysee Chotari Church, built in 1723 in the village of Nij in Gabala province, was attached to the Armenian Gregorian Church in 1836 with a special decision of the Russian Holy Synod. But the Udis did not go to church in protest and started worshiping in their homes from that day, date on. So basically, this is the narrative <clears throat> or the talking points that you will hear in virtually all the interviews and uh, publications in recent publications that this is what happened to the Udis, uh, to the uh, Caucasian Albanians because of the Russians and so on. But <clears throat> interestingly, uh, when you go to the website that promotes tourism to uh, Nij village where this church is located, and there is a website that says, explore the history and culture of Nij, village near uh, Kabbalah. Uh, what we see <clears throat> that the church has Russian iconography. For those of you who know, this is a replica or a copy of the famous Andrei Rublev uh, icon of the Holy Trinity. So we see this Russian iconography in the church, the Russian cross uh, in the church. And then interestingly, there is a Russian Bible, open Bible, and this uh, Turkish uh, symbol or uh, ornament on the lectern. It looks like a, a bottle opener or some kind of a souvenir. It says, Turkey, Turkey, and it shows here the skyline of the uh, of uh, Istanbul. So this is what we find in this uh, supposedly Caucasian Albanian church, which has a Russian Bible, Russian iconography, and a uh, I love Turkey uh, symbol on top of the lectern just as a footnote. 
Here we see uh, there are, at least from what we know, two uh, gentlemen who are the leaders of the Udi community. Here again, this leader, we see that he's wearing uh, a religious hat, which is worn by a Russian or Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox clergyman. The cross is Russian, the iconography is uh, Russian. And again, here, uh, Russian news media uh, follows these uh, people, the representatives of the uh, Udi community to these uh, religious monuments and churches that have come under Azerbaijani control now in the former uh, so-called uh, occupied territories. So here we see members of the Albanian Udi Christian religious community have begun a visit in the village of Tog in the Khodavent, uh, also known as the Hatrut region. And what we see behind is the church of Surphovannes, the Armenian church of Surphovannes. And normally these visits are accompanied by a massive uh, group of uh, media people, journalists, television, and interestingly, historians like uh, this historian who is at the site uh, telling uh, the interviewer that all these graves, all these crosses have been uh, uh, altered by the Armenians. They have put Armenian letters and crosses over uh, the graves to make them look like it is Armenian and have altered the Albanian origins of them. Now, this, uh, the effort to promote the Albanian Christian uh, heritage and the Udi uh, community is not new. Uh, those of you who remember in 2019, the same two uh, representatives wearing uh, what appears like uh, clerical garbs, they visited the Church of Holy Cross on the island of Akhtamar in Turkey, the 10th century Armenian church, which was uh, renovated a few years ago. Uh, they went in there, had uh, uh, lit candles, uh, ostensibly did some prayers uh, by, uh, of course, the uh, accompanied according to the reports when you read by the uh, Azerbaijani diaspora, they had went there uh, to visit their old Albanian church of Akhtamar, which Armenians had reappropriated and presented it as their church. Now, <clears throat> there are uh, many, many websites uh, by the Azerbaijani uh, institutions and individuals, uh, even state-sponsored, uh, where the Christian history of Karabakh is presented, of course, uh, according to the, the theories and the uh, narrative that I just uh, told you about. And interestingly, this website is supposed to be, it's called hostages.az, supposedly about uh, Azerbaijani hostages held by Armenians. But when you go to the page, uh, what you see is this Christian history of Karapakh. Sources are all Azerbaijani uh, uh, sources, publications. And here even modern Azerbaijan comprising of current Armenia and one part of Georgia is historical state located in the area. And again here, Armenian Gregorian Church had exclusive role in the violation of the freedom and independent, independence rights of Albanian Church. Now, uh, another uh, seemingly serious book, but when you read it, uh, you get an idea. Uh, this book was published in 2019. Uh, uh, supposedly about all the communities, uh, Christian communities in Azerbaijan. 
there is a few chapters about the Albanian church. But uh, very interesting that according to the official figures, there are only 3,800 Udis in Azerbaijan today. So this entire uh, uh, enormous Caucasian Albanian heritage the, that Azerbaijan is presenting or claiming is actually turns out that it's the heritage of these 3,800 uh, people. So we see some something are things are not matching. On the one hand, the Udis are the descendants of the Albanian Christians. On the other hand, the entire population of Azerbaijan are being presented as the descendants of these Christian Albanians, while saying that they are Turkic people and uh, their religion is uh, Shia Muslim. So one of the greatest steps, according to this book, of the government has been restoration of the Albanian Udi Christian religious community of Azerbaijan. So uh, what has happened now, uh, before going there, the preface of the book is written by the head of the Department of Inter-Ethnic Relations, Multiculturalism and Religious Issues of the Administration of the President of the Republic of Azerbaijan and Chairman of State Committee on Work with Religious Association of Azerbaijan Republic. Well, now they say, uh, what is the purpose of this book? Aha, uh -huh, here it is. We believe that the most important part of the book is the response to the unfounded accusations of Armenians in relation to Caucasian Albania, the exposure of Armenian lies and falsifications. As we know, Armenians are trying to falsify the history of the Caucasian Albania, attempting to assimilate the Christian heritage of this ancient Azerbaijani state. The purpose of the Armenian fraud is clear, and so on and so forth. So, uh, historical scholarship, uh, what has been written, studied over the decades, uh, medieval works, uh, evidence, and so on, these are all accusations. They are not, they have nothing to do with science and research and scholarship. As far as the Azerbaijani government is concerned, anything contrary to these claims of Azerbaijan being the descendants uh, of Caucasian Albania, anything contrary to this is accusation, false and fraud. Now, the government, in order to promote this thesis, they has established in 2014 a center called Baku International Multiculturalism Center, whereby one of the important projects of the center is the promotion of the Albanian Apostolic Church. So now it's not the Albanian Caucasian Church, the, Al the Udi community, but now we see the state is formulating a new uh, entity that's being called Albanian Apostolic Church. So you have the Armenian Apostolic Church, and now we have Albanian Apostolic Church. And pretty soon, probably, we're going to read that actually the Armenian Apostolic Church is a branch of the Albanian Apostolic Church. So this, you see that uh, there is a clear uh, government and state uh, policy to promote this kind of uh, history. Now, for anyone who's uh, uh, studied uh, Christian church denominations, history, you wonder, uh, now that these Udi Christians have come forward, 
what is their liturgy? What, what kind of liturgical books do they have? What language they pray in? Uh, what kind of hymns they have? Uh, who are their clergy? There are no clergy. They are always presented as representatives or deputy leader, leader of the Udi community. But in this book, we get a clear idea of who these two leaders are. So it turns out that after Sergi II of Ganzasar was killed, now there is no such uh, church leader in history called Sergi. What has happened, I mentioned about Catholicos Sarkis of Ganzasar, which has been now rationalized and presented as Sergi so that if they use the name Sarkis, it's going to be obvious that is an Armenian name. So according to this, Sergi II, uh, when he was killed, and I, I will come to that, the autocephalous tradition of the Albanian church was broken. So how this broken autocephaly restored? Here we go. So they to restore it, this tradition required the blessing of the ancient Eastern Church, whoever that is, the Eastern Church. And in 2008, several members of the Albanian Udi religious community received a blessing from the Patriarch of Jerusalem and were baptized in the Jordan River. Thus was restored the independence of the Albanian Udi religious organization. So uh, these people went to Jerusalem. Uh, probably they went and saw the Greek patriarch of Jerusalem. He blessed them. They went to Jordan River, were baptized, and lo and behold, the autocephaly of the Albanian Udi religious uh, church or the Church of uh, Albania is restored. Even here, there is modeling of uh, once its church, then its organization, then its uh, blessing, and so on. Now, uh, I mentioned this earlier, but uh, I talk about actually Catholicos Sarkis was not killed. He was exiled, and when he returned uh, from his exile, he was made a metropolitan uh, rather than the Catholicos under the Russian rule. Upon his death, uh, Catholicos Yeprem uh, of Echmiadzin ordained Baghdasar, a nephew of Sarkis, and the, the diocese of uh, Karapakh continued uh, thereafter. There was no such thing as he was killed or uh, assassinated. This is in my book on page 156 to 157. So again, this, uh, this whole idea of invention. So finally, what I would call this whole religious engineering, or there is a reverse engineering of uh, religious history in uh, Azerbaijan by, uh, again, denying any historical fact, denying any uh, cases or facts as truth, then erasing what's already there. They're saying, oh, the Armenians came and put their Armenian letters on this. We have to erase it and restore the uh, Azerbaijani version of it or the Turkish version of it. And then finally, inventing, literally inventing. So here, uh, I'm going to conclude with this uh, set of pictures. Uh, we saw that during the war, the church of Ghazan Sechot in uh, uh, Shushi was bombed. This is an important mother cathedral in, in Karabakh. Uh, so if this was an Albanian Christian church, why did uh, the Azerbaijani army uh, purposely damage it? And then once the Azerbaijani soldiers uh, came in, uh, took control of Shushi, they put the flag, then the 
angels at the gate of the church were destroyed. And then they put a graffiti here. And I did some research as to see, to understand what is this Kazi Kamlak Shushada, which says uh, Kazi Kamlak in Shusha. And Kazi Kamlak doesn't mean anything. It turns out, I found uh, with little bit of research, Kazi Kamlak is a village in Uljar, Rayon of Azerbaijan, with a population of 4,147. So it appears that uh, the army unit that first came to this site was from this village and they wanted to put their mark that here we are and shared it with uh, their compatriots. Now, recently, uh, President Aliyev visited this church, the destroyed church. Obviously, on the right, you see this destruction. But since the president is coming, things are cleared, looks uh, fairly clean and nice. And he walks in as a victor, as, as the conqueror, as it were, into uh, this church. Uh, and after his visit, the dome of the church was decapitated and there is scaffolding around the church. Now, here is the picture of the church in 1911. This is before Sovietization, 1911. And then when the city was burned, uh, Shusha was burned in the early 1900s. Obviously, the church was burned as well. This is how the church looked do, to, during the Soviet times, uh, dilapidated. And now they've turned it back into how it looked in Soviet times. So uh, we don't know why they took down the dome of the cathedral, why they destroyed it, what they're going to do. But this is the type of uh, erasure, denial, and re reinvention that we are uh, talking in these days. So in conclusion, I want to say that the Christian history of Karabakh is not only about the religious and Christian history of this region, but it has turned into another battleground, another uh, territory uh, that Azerbaijan is uh, waging against uh, Karabakh Armenians in particular, and generally the Armenian uh, uh, Republic of Armenia. So, thank you.